The Nerd Academy podcast is released weekly at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, available on our website at www.thenerdacademypodcast.com and wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find the Nerd Academy podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also help support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash the Nerd Academy podcast, where every donation allows us to bring you more exciting content every week. We really need to stop meeting like this. Good morning, class, and welcome back to the Nerd Academy podcast, your source for nerddom news and commentary. I am your host and superior webhead master, Jared Bachman Stubbs, and unlike normally, I am alone here. Uh, <laughs> as those of you have probably noticed, uh, output has slowed down to a crawl lately, and for that, I am sorry. Life has been life and schedules have been brutal. Uh, and I've really only had the bandwidth to work on Pro and Noob in the interim, uh, which is crazy because anybody who's keeping up with Pro and Noob knows that Pro and Noob has been driving me kind of batty. Uh, I just reinstalled voice mod and I can hear my voice. So I'm going to take off my headphones for this one. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to get back on the horse here. There is more than likely going to be a little bit of a delay again in production. I am going to try to mitigate that as much as I, as much as I possibly can, however. Um, but pardon me, more details to come on that soon. Anyway, Joker, follow you do. Um, a little bit of old news, I'm sure. But um, I did see the movie with the expressed intent of reviewing it. I said that I would I was only seeing it because I did want to talk about it. And I'm not going to let the let it pass. Um, this is going to be one of more than likely two, maybe three, probably just two, uh, kind of off the cuff mini sodes, uh, where I'm just kind of, kind of run down my thoughts on, uh, the, the, again, more than likely the two big things, uh, that I didn't really get to cover while they were in the, in, on, on the main stage with the spotlight on it. Uh, that being Joker Folly Ado and, uh, Star Wars Outlaws. Um, two things that I have a lot of complicated feelings about. Uh, but before I jump into this little mini-sode, um, these will also probably drop super close to each other. So I apologize that the you, that you're getting one of two extremes. It's either radio silence on this channel uh, for about a month, or it is you're getting you're probably going to end up getting like maybe three or four uh, uploads to this channel and this podcast feed uh, inside of a week. So. Stay tuned for that. One other little bit of housekeeping uh, before we throw to our lovely sponsors of Sunday's Bloody Mary. Um, the details of it, um, because we've been gone so long, I want to make a showing of good faith that I have not just been twiddling my thumbs. The As, as a showing of good faith, I'll kind of give a peek behind the curtain. None of the details are set in stone yet. Um you guys will know sooner than later uh, when something is ready to be released about it. But I have finished writing an outline for The Fandom Menace and How We Got Here Part 3. Um, it's a project I'm very excited to get to work on. Like I said, I'm waiting on a handful of details to kind of come into focus here about that. Uh, but once those are locked in and are a little bit more concrete, you can expect that. Fingers crossed, hopefully before the end of the year. Uh, I will not make any promises on that front, but ideally it will be before the end of the year. Um, and it will have a lot to do with um, the Acolyte, the discussions around the Acolyte, um, mostly the bad, uh, as is, tends to be the case with TFM and how we got here. Um It'll be focused on that, and then it'll be uh, it'll it'll be it'll begin with the acolyte, and then it will mostly be about um, the insanity <laughs> that was uh, what is what is it beginning of October, end of November, or, uh, end of uh, September, uh, whenever a uh, whenever most of Star Wars Twitter basically said, "Hey, um, you know, for profit bigots suck." And we're not going to put up with the bigot industrial complex uh, anymore, the grifter industrial complex. Um, I'm going between those two things as titles. I'm not sure. I haven't landed on one yet. You'll find out when it uploads, won't you? But all of that to say, 
the Phantom Menace and how we got here part three is coming. What it's going to look like, how it's going to vibe, not 100% sure yet, but it's on the way. But all of that said, before we jump into the actual discussion today, a word from our lovely sponsors at Sunday's Bloody Mary. You guys know the drill. Sunday's Bloody Mary has the most badass Bloody Mary accoutrement in the multiverse with their three-time award-winning spicy Caesar mix as well as their mild and traditional mixes of the spice and for you. And if you want to get your freak on and garnish that bad boy, you can also pick out some of their award-winning pickled dilly beans, okra, and asparagus, and rim salt if you're freaky. As I've said before, this former bartender is a big fan of a homemade from scratch Bloody Mary, and I'm not a big fan of Bloody Mary mix, but the only Bloody Mary mix I will ever let ever let grace my glass is Sundays because it is the best Bloody Mary from scratch or mixer, doesn't matter. It is the best Bloody Mary you can have. So use the link in the description down below and use code TNAP, T-N-A-P, at checkout to get 10% off your order and help out your favorite nerds while you do it. So, Joker Folly you do what you guys came for. Solo podcasts have never been my thing. Uh, <laughs> um, it's no secret, um, you know, dating back to uh, the, the the time of your, you know, Hall of Heroes, back when we were the Do Back Discussion, now Project Louder, back when we were a part of that outfit. Joker came out and it was not a secret that myself and Travis did not care for it. I, if I, if memory serves, I don't even think Spencer really gave a damn about that movie. Um, it was not overly fond of it, you know. Again, there's there there are the criticisms that everybody likes to make of it. You know, it's Taxi Driver had a baby with King of Comedy, and it's lacking a lot of that personality. I've also seen people go, well, that's the point, and that's why De Niro is in it. Um, other, there's a lot of things about there's a lot of discourse about Joker uh, that goes on that, that 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 rings true to this day that is still very much alive to this day that is very, weirdly much a part of Joker Folly Ado uh, or Joker Two if you're freaky. Um, that said, you know I think that my biggest complaint about Joker original recipe is I think it is vapid. I think that is my biggest criticism of that film, is that I, I did not think that it has very much to say at all. I think that it kind of vaguely gestures at income inequality and the kind of um, runoff effects of that. Uh, there's a... You know, because when you know in the film, Arthur is you know uh, he he is very low income, he is disabled, he comes from an abusive background. You know, like he's he's a very underprivileged, underserved individual, and we see little by little the way that people who are incredibly privileged, who are incredibly wealthy, uh, are actively ruining Arthur's life not necessarily directly, not even necessarily maliciously, um, but just kind of by virtue of like the banality of evil that is capitalism, right? And we see this in many different ways. We see it in the way that funding is cut and he is not able to get the medical services that he should be entitled to. We see this in the stockbroker douchebags who jump him on the train. We see this in the you know, left murky intentionally potential relation to the Wayne family, uh, that he might be the bastard son of Thomas Wayne. Um, you know, I think there's also an interesting relationship there about like the, the relationship between Batman and the Joker. Now leave it to me to take anything even remotely set or anything remotely to do with Gotham City uh, to immediately bring it back to Batman and make it completely about Bruce Wayne. Um, he said, sitting here in this review for in his Justice League Roosevelt's, um, you know, I think my favorite part of that movie, and I'm curious to know if it was ever intentional in Todd Phillips' part, that uh, even at the very beginning of their relationship, the first time that Bruce Wayne would meet Joker, um, there, the, the, what is the first thing the Joker tries to do for Batman? He makes him smile. Um, that I like, like that is something that I was like, oh, like that. There's something good there, uh, and then I immediately become disillusioned by it. 
because on top of the, and I'll, and I'll get back to my initial point about the first film feeling vapid. And it does feel important to kind of circle back to the first film here. The a whole, uh, you know, like I immediately feels vapid, immediately feels empty because Todd Phillips, you know, had so much bluster about comic book cinema in 2019 leading up to Joker. Uh, you know, it is the, it is, you know, I, you know, I think people are weirdly hard on the MCU these days and I don't think it's in good faith, but you had what is, I think most people would say inarguably the Zenith of the MCU at the time. I made my glasses more dirty by doing that. Um, you had what was arguably the Zenith of the MCU. Um, you know, we're, we're a year after infinity war. We're only a few months after end game. Um, and everyone's like, wow, like it's incredible. You know, where do you go from this? Whatever. And up to this point, you know, Todd Phillips is in the press and he won't stop talking about how much, um, he loathes comic book films. This also comes on the heels of the, often taken out of context, often, uh, again, very poor faith uh, conversations about the infamous Scorsese, um, you know, roller coaster rides thing. Um, so there was a lot of animus towards comic book cinema at the time. And Todd Phillips, you know, fanned the flames of this, you know, talking about how he was going to make a real movie about real things and he was going to disguise it as a comic book so us fucking nerds would go see his high-minded auteur film. Um, so in those brief moments where there are allusions to and there is, um, you know, iterating upon the, you know, nearly 100-year history of the Batman and of the Joker – uh, there are moments where I'm like, ooh, like that's really good. Again, like he makes Bruce Wayne smile. It, it, you know, you you get nods towards the cyclical nature of the Batman Joker relationship, where if it is not for the transgressions of Thomas Wayne, Arthur Fleck may not have lashed out and lost control in the way he did. And once he loses control and causes this riot, causes this apparently social movement um, in Gotham. It results in the Wayne murder that we at home, we as the audience, we who are familiar with the source material know that that is the birth of the Batman. Um, there's a lot of interesting ideas about Bat about Joker's relationship to a character who is not present in the film. A very young Bruce Wayne is, but Batman is not. And I think that the I do think that the film nods very fascinatingly towards those elements of you know, the, the relationship between Batman and Joker. Um, but like I said, Todd Phillips is like, fuck you comic book movies. Fuck you comic books in general. Um, we want none of that. And I'm able, and I, and I, and I think the thing that I find the most compelling about the film kind of falls out the window. Why do I find that the most compelling? Well, back to what I was saying about the social commentary, all of this wealth inequality, all of this income inequality, all of the, rich people are the parasites on society, actually not the poor. Um, and Todd Phillips never really has an opinion about that. Uh, he shows that it's happening and he shows that it's bad, but he also just kind of shows that human beings, um, humanity in general is unkind and cruel and vicious and it's incredibly pessimistic. And again, you're telling a story inside of the, you know, Gotham oeuvre, um, you know, tales from Gotham City. So, yeah, I mean, there is an element of this city is the city is awful and it does and it makes people awful. I will concede that much. But for as much uh, bluster as Phillips had going into this film, um, it does not arrive at a conclusion about the Joker. And I don't say that as somebody who needs the movie to tell me that the Joker is bad. Um, I don't even necessarily need the movie to tell me how I should think or what I should think about the Joker. Um, I just don't think Todd Phillips expounded upon an idea about the world other than society bad, um, people bad. Um, and it is something that has had that I've soured more and more on with Joker as time has gone on. Um, now that said, I know I don't like to dwell on the negative here. 
Um, you know, I would much rather talk about what makes art, especially like, you know, your nerd pop culture art, uh, compelling and fascinating. And, you know, in that vein, you know, I think the film is, uh, chock full of incredible performances. Um, I think it is beautifully shot. I think the score is remarkable. Um, it's just, I don't know what it's supposed to be about. I don't know. I don't know what it wants to say. Uh, other than, you know, society bad. And when society is bad enough to one guy, maybe he'll go fucking crazy and start a riot, maybe. And that is where Joker leaves you. Now we come into Joker Folly Adieu or Joker, I promise it's not a musical. Uh, and again, I think that there is a weird phenomenon where I think Todd Phillips hates the genre. Um, which is weird because he spent the media, you know, the media train up to Joker one, its release talking about, you know, real movie disguised as a comic book movie, real movie disguised as a comic book movie, real movie disguised as a comic book movie. He's, a, he's ashamed of the fact that he made a cape flick. And then we get to Joker Folly Adieu and it's him telling everybody I promise it's not a fucking musical. And it's kind of barely a musical. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about the, you know, ev about ev once every 15, 10 to 15 minutes, somebody will um, kind of talk through the introduction to a song and then kind of half talk, sing it, and then it's over. Uh, you know, I think the only part of the film that really led into the surreality of musicals, and again, you know, I'm, I'm no expert, you know, I'm not even gonna say I have a background in, you know, I did theater in high school, I did theater for uh, quite a few years after, um, uh, after, after I had graduated high school, you know, I love theater, I love live performance. Um, you know, it's something I love. It's something I've, I wouldn't say I've studied, but I have, I've, I have always been surrounded by people who have. Um, so I'm not necessarily going to gr grade or judge Joker Folly Adieu on, a, on, on that principle of like, is the music, el musical element good? Um, so much as it's how effective was it for me? Um, which I do think are two different things. And for me, you know, it's it's weird. Um, it does not lean into the surreality as much as it could. Um, I think it plays it safe. I think it plays it as safe as it can because it, it leans into the surreality of we have a character who is, by virtue of being the fucking Joker, um, is an unreliable narrator, right? But um, with that, caveat of unreliable narrator you're able to do a lot of things like there is kind of this like murky idea of like you know is everybody dancing and singing is this a proper musical where there is this you know extended reality where once the emotions are too big to say you must sing them and is everybody part of that you know like if you watch hairspray or guys and dolls or singing in the rain um, as just, you know, off the top of my head, like kind of classic examples, you know, that's the basic premise is that everybody is kind of living in this fantastical world where once the feelings are too big, everybody feels a song in them. So Joker Folly Adieu, you know, it's, it, it doesn't go quite that far. It doesn't quite invite the audience to go and hear when you have a feeling too big, you got to sing it very much goes, oh yeah, and because Arthur's crazy, he imagines he's in a musical. And it brings me to my, like, yes, but relationship with Joker Folly Adieu. Yes, I, th like, <laughs> the musical sequences, I think, are kind of fun. I think they're a little underwhelming. I don't think they have as much flavor as it could. Um, you know, I said to some friends after I got in the movie, I said, this movie kind of has the sauce. It has a little bit of sauce on the side. Um, it's not it's not tossed in the sauce, but it has sauce on the side. In that meaning, like the moments where they let it get into this, again, extended reality 
where you, where you, when you're asking the question, you know, is, is this a world of song and dance or is this all in Arthur's head where you kind of go, it doesn't matter which it is because to him it is true. So it doesn't matter if the world really is like this or if it is just in his head, it is all real to him. You know, the grandiosity, the theatricality, um, you know, this very like alpha male stoic persona he wants to have is real in that world. I find that compelling, but it's lackluster. It does not, it does not play enough of a role in the movie um, for me. I wish there was more there. I wish there was more meat on the bone for this to not necessarily justify, but really elaborate upon what they were going for. Again, with this surreality, um, I think it plays really interestingly with Arthur's relationship to the Joker persona, um, because throughout the film, Arthur and Joker really do feel like two different people. Um, you know, there was Arthur Fleck, who is, you know, kind of reverted back. Um, and I don't say that as a pejorative necessarily, but he is kind of reverted back to his more soft-spoken, um, timid, trepidatious self uh, in, in the earlier chunks of the movie. And then whenever he goes into this dreamlike world where he is, you know, doing a waltz with, uh, with Harley Quinn uh, in front of, you know, Hotel Arkham, it is... You know, he goes from being like, oh, yeah, you know, very, you know, whatever with Arthur to, again, this very stoic, I don't want to say suave, but again, it's a, it, like, like he does, he really does feel written as an alpha male type. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean the type of person alpha males think they are. I mean, the type of person they are using the label that you give themselves, um, you know, where like every time smoking a cigarette you know, every time the nice suit, every time just kind of like uninterested in what's going on around him, where Arthur is kind of in this constant state of like frantic anticipation, um, you know, and the few times we see Arthur outside of that dreamscape or even outside of the makeup and the suits um, kind of tap into the Joker persona, it is an impotent rage. It is an impotent f like fury. Uh, where he just kind of lashes out and motherfucks somebody in a very again kind of petulant way. Um, and that brings you to one of the things I found the most fascinating about this film is it is 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 Joker Arthur's characterization and the relationship with the Joker persona. Um, and again, I don't quite know if this is Todd Phillips' intent, but you know, that's what death of the author is for. If I am right about what this movie was going for, I think it retroactively makes me like Joker a lot more. And I think I like what this movie is going for enough that I like both of the movies, if my interpretation is right. Now, Todd Phillips can come out tomorrow and say that I am dead wrong, and I will probably go back to having a net negative opinion on this little mini franchise. But if the first Joker film is about a man who feels um, emasculated, uh, disenfranchised, um, put upon by a greater society, snapping and lashing out and galvanizing people who are in a similar headspace to him to behave like him, then Joker 2 is about how these icons, these um larger than life personalities these martyrs uh that are created by people who might be on the fringes but use that as a justification to become violent lunatics and how the martyrdom of that figure will make sure that that figure never lives up to their own legend because, and again, and a lot of people have talked about how like Joker 2 seems really interested in litigating the first movie, quite literally, because most of this movie takes place in a fucking courtroom. Um, it is Arkham and a courtroom, and that is it. Um, 
But no, because, you know, again, let's, let's hop back in the time machines. Go, let's go into the TARDIS. Um, you go back to 2019. And Joker won. You know, people are people are nervous about it. Um, now, I think a lot of people like to do a revisionist history and say that everybody sounded crazy because they thought there would be some type of um, mass casualty event because of the Joker movie. And gee, golly, wow, weren't all those people who were worried about that uh, really stupid. And I think there's a slight revisionist history there. I think we are undercutting uh, the fact that there were a lot of mass shootings. Um, political violence has, was on the rise in the Trump years, um, particularly a uh, specific flavor of, um, you know, militia e white power group type violence. And that around the time, uh, for those of you who aren't brain broken by the Internet, um, a lot of like the clown world type stuff was still popular. And like the clown world stuff was like a lot of like Nazi dog whistling. Um, and because of Joker, some groups were like, oh, look at this movie about clown world. So like there was reason to be a little bit, you know, jumpy uh, about things. Um, and that, again, that's to say nothing of the fact that before then, the last big proper Batman movie um, had a tragic mass shooting attached to it when The Dark Knight Rises came out um, in Aurora. So, you know, and again, it, I, did I think it was weird that we had already gone through a new Joker before the Joker movie? Uh, and nobody was like, at least to my memory, no one was like, there's going to be a mass shooting at the Suicide Squad. Um, sure, whatever. But... You know, so many people were like, oh, what does this movie, what does this movie say? What does this movie mean? And, you know, a lot, I think a lot of people correctly predicted, and I think part of it might be a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, the way that the first Joker film did kind of have that, you know, it's about angry white guys freaking the fuck out. Um, and, you know, where I think the angry white guys freaking the fuck out metaphor loses a little bit of steam is that. If there is an angry white guy who I can look at and go, if you're going to bug out, I kind of get it. It's the, it's the victim of lifelong abuse who has had like medical resources taken away from him, who is on the verge of, and then it, you know, delves into a violent mental health episode. So I get that. But ever since then, so much of the conversation about Joker has been like, it feels like this narrative you know, kind of handmade for a very specific flavor of a grieved white guy. And this film, if this is its intent, really cool, not cool, but like compelling, is that it wants to analyze the types of figures that these guys put on a pedestal. The unabashedly nihilistic like above it all guy, you know, the person who looks at the world and goes, it's all bad. So fuck it. Um, you know, I, I think, I think that's a flavor of person who's really frustrating a flavor of person who's probably, um, feel seen by these films because the, the end of the day, like at least to me, the first Joker film says, fuck it. It is not interested in, any type of analysis beyond people suck. And if you suck enough at a person, they too will become awful. Um, or again, this film goes, okay, but like that person who becomes martyred by this flavor of person for being brave enough to say, fuck it and fuck you. Um, what happens to them? And the answer is, is they don't live up to the example. Um, you know, if you want to use the, the, um, you know, use the whole incel thing. People are talking about how Joker's an incel movie. Um, you know, uh, loyal listeners and loyal viewers of this show know how much um, I am compelled and, you know, research and keep up with, you know, journalists who, you know, study and keep tabs on the conspiracy movements of the country and uh, in the world. And uh, the founder of 8 Kun, uh, 8chan, 
uh, in layman's terms, kind of, uh, whose name escapes me. Uh, but he was on an incel uh, message board. And, you know, in incel communities, there's a really there's a really dedicated sense of, you know, if we're going to commit to being an incel, then it's got to be that way forever. And if you manage to get laid, you are made a pariah. Um, and the founder of eight coon, um, you can find this in the, uh, HBO documentary Q into the storm. Um, this story, I believe, I believe they tell it there. It's also been on Cuba anonymous a couple times, but, um, you know, he eventually has sex and is kind of cast out from this community. He's banished. He is exiled. And because he fa he failed to live up to the standard. And I think that's what a lot of what Joker Folly Do is about. Um, I think that's what the ending is about, is that no matter uh, how dedicated to these incredibly nihilistic causes you are if by the end as most people do come out of that nihilistic phase and go things actually are important and i don't think i want this in the way that arthur is like there is no joker i i am not him i don't want to be him and in the way that he is kind of taken captive by a reflection of his creation uh after the bomb goes off at the courthouse and he's ushered away and, you know, he's, he's taken captive by the Joker, um, by these kind of like wantonly violent lunatics who are like, you know, very, very early Tyler, the creator, you know, chromacopia is on the horizon. So I'll use that as reference. Um, but it's very, you know, the fuck school, kill people, burn shit, goblin, Tyler, the creator era. Right. And he's, he's it's that being evoked by his followers. And again, Arthur is like, I don't want this. I don't want that. You know, I snapped. I shouldn't have done what I did. Um, and I do think on some level, Arthur does feel guilt. You know, I obviously when he's given the chance to run away, he does. Um, and I think that Arthur's spoilers death is a direct result of his cowardice. I think it is because he is, he goes, I condemn the Joker. I am not the Joker. It was me. I take responsibility. He then runs away from that responsibility and ends up embraced by the Joker persona again and then rejects it and then tries to go back to something in Harley who only loved him for the Joker and then is rejected by her and then dies for it. Um, I think that's very compelling. And again, he is replaced. You know, by the guy giving himself the Glasgow smile. And I think I'm going to break rank uh, with a lot of my peers. I don't mind the guy giving himself the Glasgow smile. I do not mind it. Um, I think that it is weird to say that since Heath Ledger's Joker was kind of the first mainstream instance of Glasgow smile Joker, that he is now the only person who can have that. Um, I think that's silly. Uh, <laughs> um you know, I, I, I think it I think it became an iconic piece of Joker iconography, even though in the comics, that's never really been the thing. You know, it's the acid froze the nerve endings and the permanent smile um, for the most part. But we've seen shades of it in the comics, you know, the Scott Snyder, Greg Capullo, New 52 Batman stuff kind of, you know, it's not exactly again, like, you know, I wonder how I got these scars type of joker face but you know it, it's still like the self-mutilating you know stuff um it, i think it has worked its way into the joker canon um that there is room for that and i think that in this universe um manifesting the next joker as a more extreme evolution of it i think plays well into this this potential metaphor um for the ways that extremist martyrs will always be replaced and will always have to be kind of like ratcheted up in terms of intensity. Um, so yeah, if the movie is about nihilistic figureheads and martyrs and the way that the, that, that path always leads to destruction and always leads to uh, disposability and that, you know, even Arthur doesn't want this. I do find it compelling. Um, and on that front, I don't hate Joker Folly. You do. I, I think it might be 
kind of good. Um, but again, there is, it, it, but like it, it is weighed down by, um, you know, I don't know that the film knows what it wants to be. I think that it stops itself short of leaning into its more fanciful nature uh, where it could have benefited from it. Um, I will say, I think Lady Gaga's potential in this film is absolutely squandered. Um, she is good in the role. Um, you know, I think Lady Gaga is a great, is a, is a pretty good actor. Um, and an incredible vocalist, obviously. And I am, uh, kind of really disappointed by how little they really allow her to shine in this role. I think leaning into the, you know, Joker is uh, suffering from a lot of flights of fancy as he's trying to maneuver this world, maneuver this persona. Um, you know, I think they should have leaned into it more. I think they should have made it more showy. Um, and they don't. And I'm disappointed by that. And, you know, I think it's weird that, I think it's a weird choice for Arthur to be framed as sympathetic by the end for him being rejected by Harley Quinn. Um, I think that, I think that it's an interesting concept, you know, I, th I think that might be, you know, that, that, that might be the thesis statement of this review. A lot of interesting concepts. I think it's an interesting concept for Harley Quinn to be the more manipulative one in the relationship. Um, now, I think to do that, you have to lean into this idea that Arthur has regressed and is now afraid of the Joker persona. Um, a choice that I could go both ways with. You know, I think, I think the choice, I, I, again, I think a lot of people dislike the whole Arthur runs away from the Joker to then embrace it and then go, no, no more. Um, and then pay the price for, you know, creating this cultic worship and then denying it. Um, I like the choice. I can get down with it. I understand why other people think that it is a cowardly decision. Um, and again, this idea that Harley Quinn is kind of like the most fervent member of the cult uh, and wants that proximity. I think it's interesting. I do not think Todd Phillips maintains the tact and subtlety uh, to have a woman be in this role and play this and, 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 and play, play this role in the narrative uh, and it not kind of boil down to a weird kind of misogynistic place. Um, you know, I think that I've seen people say, you know, the whole, like, I think we're past the point of having to do jo stories about Joker and Harley as a unit. And I don't particularly agree with that just because I don't think we will ever be past the point of telling a certain type of story, like any type of story. Um, you know, if there is if, if there is a story to be told with a message to be heard in a, you know, that involves Joker and Harley being at the peak of their, you know, relationship again, very abusive relationship in the source material. It's always been the case. Um, there is there, there's always going to be room for that. The thing is, is, we just need more. We just need tactful writers to write it. And I think Todd Phillips kind of not being able to control the urge for it to be. Well, if Harley is the manipulative one, then she has to use her. She has to seduce him. And that, you know, then it immediately goes to that place. But again, here's your cop out with Arthur's fucking crazy. Um, did Arthur hallucinate Harley somehow sneaking into the prison to have sex with him? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so yeah. Um, again, I think the movie is, uh, I think it's well acted for the most part. I think that they made some interesting choices. Um, and sometimes for me, I can be entertained enough by interesting choices. Coming out of the theater, I was pretty I was pretty jazzed about this. And after having almost a month to simmer on it, um, I don't know if those interesting choices did quite enough for me. Um, I think that, again, I think it is a really cool concept to talk about becoming an idea, becoming this manifestation of a lot of other people's 
relationships to society at large. And then when you fall short of that, um, you are no longer a useful figurehead. You're no longer a good martyr and you need to be replaced by somebody more extreme. I think there is a good metaphor about incel violence in here. I don't know if Todd Phillips meant to do that. In the same way, I don't know if Todd Phillips meant for the first time Batman and Joker ever meet that he tried to put a smile on Batman's face. And the reason I don't feel like he meant to do that is because this movie ends the way he wanted the first one to end, apparently, allegedly, with Arthur being replaced by what will become the true Joker. Do with that what you will. But, um, yeah, those are my thoughts on Joker Fully You Do. Um, again, these solo podcasts aren't typically my thing. So get in the comments and let me know if this was something you enjoyed. If, uh, you know, more kind of solo, directly talking to the camera type fare is something you guys enjoy. Like I said, I'm going to try to be back on the horse here as much as I can be. Uh, there might be a slight hiccup here soon about uh, me getting stuff out, but assuming everything goes according to plan um, and depending on timetables, you know, we will be covering Skeleton Crew. There may or may not be the after show live streams. We will see. All in due time, uh, but expect a conversation about Star Wars Outlaws uh, coming soon. Um, expect a very girthy fucking news roundup as well very soon. And, um, yeah, and if I'm able to make it out there to the theater this weekend, a Joker, Joker, Venom the Last Dance review. <laughs> anyway, um, one moment. But to round out this mini uh, review episode, I say mini, it was 40 minutes. Um, I would like to, because we're coming off of a little bit of a hiatus here, accidental hiatus, I'm great at that. I would like to shout out all of our patrons. So I want to give props to a litany of friends of the show, uh, alumni and students alike. Scotty J. Rowe, Armin from Comic Book Cast, Brendan Marr from Page Turners and We're Not, uh, Buck O'Brien, Eli from Star Wars in a Galaxy, um, former uh, co-host Levi, Ray Clausen, uh, Paco, and Charlotte. Thank you guys for supporting the channel. Uh, be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe uh, on the Patreon. Uh, we are getting caught up on the Versus series. It's another thing we've been trying to work on. Um, Eli is going to be co-hosting a couple episodes. So he and I already did Grand Inquisitor versus Keller and Beck. Uh, that is on the Patreon now. Um, we're kind of winding down. Next week, we plan on recording The Stranger versus Darth Plagueis, um, which we will probably be releasing on Halloween. This is our Halloween special episode. We'd like to do you know a little spooky theme this year. Aside from the acolyte connections, aside from the fact that I think I said publicly, the only thing keeping me from wanting to do um, Stranger versus Plagueis was I want to see maybe this will play out in the show. Obviously, that's not fucking happening. But um, now I feel kind of free to do it because I don't have to worry about you know being immediately proven wrong by season two, unfortunately. But um, we're going to be doing, you know, the mad scientist versus the supernatural slasher villain. So stay tuned for that. That will be releasing to the public on Halloween day if we're able to get it recorded before then. Um, so stay tuned for that. And if you want more versus stuff, uh, there is a massive back catalog of episodes Spencer and I have done. It's our baby. Uh, and Eli will be joining us again for Stranger versus Plagueis. And then we will get back uh in the saddle here for Savage Press versus Kylo Ren and then our two part uh season finale that I don't remember if I've ever said publicly what the matchup is so I'm just not going to do it in the event the past Jared wanted to keep it a surprise but uh yeah thank you everybody uh for watching and listening uh class dismissed stop move away from the cookie jar